Hello, everyone. Welcome back to our course. In this chapter, we are going to introduce Spark, which is an in-memory distributed computing engine. Firstly, let's have a look at the overview of Spark. Spark was born in the AMP lab at the University of California, Berkeley, in 2009, and contributed to Apache as an open source project in 2010. In a sense, Spark is a fast, versatile, and scalable memory-based big data computing engine. We can highlight these four words. The versatile and scalable big data computing engine may remind you of the MapReduce, which is an offline batch processing engine, so the versatile and scalable can be seen as the common feature of the big data computing engine. But Spark is also different from the MapReduce, for Spark is a memory-based computing engine, while MapReduce stores the intermediate data into hard disks. This is the reason why Spark is much faster than MapReduce. Besides, Spark is a one-stop solution that integrates batch processing, real-time stream processing, interactive query, graph computing, and machine learning. These powerful functions help Spark capture the different needs at different scenarios. By comparison, MapReduce could only be used in batch processing scenarios. So now you can find that Spark is really a powerful computing engine. And thanks to all the good features, Spark can support many different applications. For example, the batch processing module can be used for extracting, transforming, and loading, or ETL in short. These three steps can be seen as the important part of data processing. By doing this, we can improve the data quality and thus the efficiency of data analysis can be enhanced as well. The machine learning module can also solve the classification problem. For example, it can be used to automatically determine whether comments of eBay buyers are positive or negative. Actually, it is a typical binary classification problem, and the logistic regression model and the Bayesian algorithm in Spark can be used to solve this kind of problem. What's more, the interactive analysis in Spark can be used to query the Hive data warehouse, which is used to analyze the data, and stream processing can be used for real-time businesses such as page click stream analysis, recommendation systems, and public opinion analysis. So in short, Spark is really powerful and we can use Spark in many different data processing application scenarios. Then, what are the highlights of Spark? Actually, we have already introduced a lot. This slide shows us four keywords of Spark. Lightweight, fast, flexible, and smart. We say that Spark is light because its core code has only 30,000 lines. Do you know what programming language is used to program Spark? Yes, it is Scala, which is a little bit similar to Java, but in general, Scala is much simpler. As for fast, we have explained that Spark is memory-based, and computation in memory is a lot faster than that in hard disks. Here we can see Spark has sub-second level latency for small datasets. In general, Spark can be 100 faster than MapReduce. And you may benefit even more from Spark when multiple iterations of computation are needed. The third highlight is flexible. Spark provides flexibility at different levels. 
For example, Spark supports new data operators, different data sources, and many programming interfaces. It includes JDBC, Scala, Python, R, etc. And besides, written in Scala, Spark allows new computation operators being implemented. Simply speaking, an operator can be seen as a well-defined function, and whenever we need a new operator, just write a new function. By contrast, in MapReduce, there are just two operators, Map and Reduce. That is why we say Spark is more flexible than MapReduce. The last highlight is Smart, and we say Spark smartly uses existing big data components, including using Hadoop as its ecosystem without introducing something new. Thus, we don't have to learn something again from the very beginning. And this part, we will compare MapReduce with Spark. Let's see a result table of an evaluation. To evaluate these improvements, we decided to participate in the sort benchmark. With help from Amazon Web Services, we participated in the Daytona Gray category, an industry benchmark on how fast a system can sort 100 terabytes of data. The previous world record was 72 minutes, set by Yahoo using an Hadoop MapReduce cluster of 2,100 nodes. Using Spark on merely 206 nodes, we completed the benchmark in 23 minutes. This means that Spark sorted the same data three times faster with 10 times fewer machines. Additionally, while no official petabyte sort competition exists, Spark is pushed further to also sort one petabyte of data on 190 machines in under four hours. This petabyte time beats previously reported results based on Hadoop MapReduce in 2009, which was 16 hours on 3,800 machines. To the best of our knowledge, this is the first petabyte scale thought ever done in a public cloud. So from these results, now you can find how powerful Spark is, right? Then, what does the Spark system architecture look like? Here, you can see a graph, and we can roughly divide it into three layers. Let's take a look at the bottom layer at first. The bottom layer shows three different deployment modes of Spark. So, YAM is known as the Unified Resource Negotiator Framework in Hadoop. Spark can also rely on YAM for resource allocation. But in addition to that, Spark also supports standalone and Spark on methods. Here, the standalone mode means that Spark needs to take care of the resource allocation on its own without any help from other tools. So it is not recommended if there is a huge Spark cluster or if the computation is very heavy. Methods is another resource allocation tool, so you can also have a try if interested. Above all the three deployment modes, the middle layer is the Spark core. This is the brain of Spark whose most striking feature is to put the intermediate computing result directly into the memory to improve the computing framework. And on the top layer, these are various applications and modules. Firstly, Spark SQL, which is a Spark component for processing structured data. As a part of Big Data Framework of Apache Spark, it is mainly used to process structured data and implement SQL-like query. Users can perform the ETL operation on data in different formats and of different sources through Spark SQL, completing specific query operations. 
Secondly, structure streaming. As we can see, this is a new guy of Spark 2.0, which is built up based on Spark SQL. It offers real-time analysis for structured data streams. In Spark Streaming, it indicates the mini-batch stream processing engine. which can provide second-level data processing in most cases. After fragmenting streaming data, it uses the computing engine of Spark Core to process the streaming data. MLlib and GraphX are algorithm libraries. MLlib offers the plenty of machine learning algorithms, including the supervised learning algorithms such as CART, SVM, and naive Bayesian algorithms, and unsupervised algorithms like k-means and so on. As mentioned before, these algorithms operate iteratively to get the optimal model which is very suitable for Spark. And GraphX is not for visualization. GraphX it's a new component in Spark for graphs and graph parallel computation. At a high level, GraphX extends the Spark RDD by introducing a new graph abstraction, a directed multi-graph with properties attached to each vertex and edge. It is widely used in graph computing for social networking sites with the choice of complex communication relationships in social networks such as Facebook, Twitter, etc. And finally, Spark R is an R package that provides a lightweight front-end to use Apache Spark from R language. And in order to understand Spark, there is a key point which is called Spark RDD. So what is Spark RDD? RDD is the short of Resilient Distributed Datasets. In fact, RDD is the abstraction of the basic data in Spark, and WOM RDD is an elastic, read-only, and partitioned distributed dataset. And to be more specific, RDD is just the foundation of Spark Core, since eventually all the processes running in Spark Core will be translated in the format of RDDs. And since Spark Core runs tasks in memory, so RDDs are stored in the memory by default. But if the memory is not enough, then RDD can be written into hard disks. This is why we say RDD is resilient. So how is RDD generated? An RDD can be created from Hadoop file system, Alternatively, an RDD can be converted from a parent RDD. For example, there are many RDDs, RDD1, 2, and so on. RDD1 is created from HDFS, and RDD1 is the parent to generate RDD2. And the way to record how an RDD is generated is called a lineage of it. Here you can see the lineage mechanism allows for rapid data recovery when data loss occurs. That is why we say it guarantees the high stability of Spark. But how to do rapid data recovery based on this lineage mechanism? We know that the lineage records how an RDD is generated. For example, RDD2 is generated from RDD1 by some operator like uh, FlatMap. And so, if RDD2 is lost, we can turn to RDD1 for help. And because RDD is read-only, so RDD1 will not be modified. So now we just need to recalculate RDD2, and then it can be recovered. And talking about lineage mechanism, in fact, the lineage chain is recorded according to the dependency relationships. And in Spark, there are a series of dependencies between RDDs, 
which can be divided into narrow dependencies and wide dependencies. The left side of graph represents the narrow dependencies, while the right side represents the wide dependencies. So, what is the difference? Let's take a look at the narrow dependencies at first. And please note that the arrows always start from the parent RDD to the child RDDs. And each blue box here represents one partition in each RDD. For example, in this RDD, there are three partitions. So, by definition, narrow dependencies represent that each partition of the parent RDD is used by at most one partition of the child RDD. Or namely, each parent partition in narrow dependencies here could have at most one child partition. So one to one, in short. And in a more general case, many to one is also a narrow dependency. Because in this case, each partition in the parent RD just has one child as well. But maybe this is the father and this is the mother, right? By contrast, for wide dependencies, each partition of the parent RDD may be used by multiple child RDD partitions. Now, each parent partition in wide dependencies have more than just one child partition. And we say it is one to many. So in conclusion, the narrow dependency can be seen as the single child family, and the wide dependency can be seen as a many children family. And finally, we can conclude this chapter by introducing two more data structures that are also widely used in Spark. So the fundamental one is just RDD as we mentioned before. But in some cases, especially if we need to use Spark SQL to do structured data analysis, RDD is not so efficient. Therefore, people designed data frame and data set for help. Suppose that we have a CSV file with just two lines, for example. Then, for RDD, it just simply read data, but nothing modification will be done. So RDD is just reading data in the original file format. And if we need to do analysis, some operators like flatmap needs to be implemented. And if we turn to data frame, now it is just in the format of two-dimensional table like we are using the MySQL databases. In data frame, we can find rows and columns. But likewise, we need to predefine the schema. Or namely, the data structure before using it. For example, we need to predefine all the column names as well as all the data types before loading data into the data frame. And if you are familiar with relational databases, this is just the same case. And after defining the data schema, then we can use the SQL statements to do efficient data analysis. And apart from data frames, Spark SQL could also use data sets for analysis. So data sets looks like a little bit weird. And in fact, the data set in Spark is a collection of objects. But what is an object? An object is just an abstraction of the instances in real life. For example, a person is an object 
and a car is also an object. So when we talk about a person, we need some information like name, gender, age, ID number, address, and maybe nationality in different cases, right? And likewise, when we talk about a car, we may focus on its color, brand, license plate number, and perhaps its price and owner, etc. And all of this descriptive information of an object is known as the property or feature of an object. So in the example as shown in our slide, the data set is just a collection of people object. And for the people object, in this case, we mainly focus on the properties of age, ID, and name. So you can find the first line is for the object Alan. And the second line is for the object Bobby. But again, if you want to use the sets in Spark, at first, you need to predefine that class of objects as shown here. So this is the definition of people class, which is very important. And if you are familiar with some object-oriented programming languages like Java, then this should be easy to understand. All right, that's all for this chapter. In this chapter, we introduced what is Spark, some application scenarios and features of Spark, a comparison between Spark and MapReduce, the architecture of Spark, Spark RDD, and two kinds of dependencies, and introduced the differences between RDD, data frame, and data set. Hope you guys enjoy all the contents in this chapter, and see you in the next chapter. Mm -hmm.